Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ellen and I'm an enthusiastic, boundlessly grateful Al-Anon. You too, huh? I am happy to be here. I'm so happy to see Lynn again, and I'm so happy to see Lynn happy. Um, You know, I always want the people I love to be happy, and they just never will do that for me. So even if just one of them minds, it makes me happy. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Laurie. (laughs) Um, Thank you for having me. You you live in paradise, but you already know that. Um, And I welcome every chance I get to visit you in in your paradise. I introduced myself as an Al-Anon, and I feel the need to explain it. Uh, That's not good news. (laughs) Explaining things is how I got to (laughs) Al-Anon. I always thought if I could get you to listen long enough, then you'd understand. And, and And you'd see why my way really was the better way, and you'd agree to do it, and then we'd all be happy. Part of the dichotomy of my recovery is that God says, you are so good at explaining. I'm just going to send you around to all sorts of little pockets of people and just let you explain your heart away. And uh, tonight's your night in the basket. (laughs) So, Al-Anon isn't what I wanted to be when I grew up. I didn't know there was such a thing as Al-Anon to be. Even when I got here, I didn't know there was such a thing as Al-Anon to be. I think from my first breath and maybe even before that, there was one thing I wanted. I wanted to be somebody's wife and somebody's mother, and I was going to be the best wife he ever had, and I was going to be the best mother those children ever had. And it didn't occur to me until I'd been in Al-Anon a couple of years that never in my whole life until I got here did I ever want to be me. Did I ever want to be the best wife I could be or the best mother I could be? I always wanted to be the best in somebody else's eyes. Can't do it. It's, It's a guaranteed failure job. What I ended up being was somebody's judge and somebody's juror and somebody's executioner, and we were all miserable. And when I got to Al-Anon, I didn't want to be here, but then I never wanted to be where I was. I always wanted to be someplace else with somebody else doing something else. Um, And when I got here, I decided um, maybe – I don't think I'd been here very long, maybe a year, maybe two years, I think maybe a year. And I decided what I really wanted to be was alcoholic. And I had a couple of reasons for that. You know, if you're an explainer, you need good reasons, and I always have reasons. Um, The reasons I wanted to be alcoholic were, number one, it looked to me like alcoholic women had a lot more fun than we did. (laughs) And number two, apparently my husband preferred them. (laughs) (laughs) Not judging, just reporting. (laughs) Um, So I decided I wanted to be alcoholic. Now, uh, the, I didn't want to drink to be alcoholic. And a couple of reasons for that, too. For one thing, I come from a family of heavy drinkers. I come from a family that acted as if there was something the matter with people who didn't drink. Now, I know I have selective hearing, and I know that I hear what I want to hear regardless of what you said. What I hear may have something to do with what you said, and it may have nothing to do with what you said. So what I thought I heard them say, they probably didn't say. But what I could have sworn I heard them say was, you should stay away from people who don't drink. They're fanatics. They could even be Baptists. (laughs) I'm pretty sure they never said that, but that's what I heard. Uh, I grew up where drinking was the norm. I grew up where there were a lo- uh, there was a lot of heavy drinking, and there was some more than heavy drinking. And I've been around long enough, been in enough op- open AA meetings that I know that most people who become alcoholic don't get any recovery. Most people who cross the line don't um, don't get to recover. And I had two drinks every night, and I enjoyed both of them. Really, I did. I enjoyed both of those drinks. It was like smoking. It was such a grown-up thing, you know. Have a little drink and a little smoke. Oh, my goodness, I'm getting tired. I'll have to stop. And that's what I do. But I was afraid that if I let myself drink all there was, it maybe I'd cross the line. And I didn't want to push that line. And the other reason I didn't want to drink to be alcoholic was that I needed to be alcoholic that afternoon. (laughs) I really didn't have time. So... (laughs) 
the solution I came up with is the same solution I always come up with in my diseasiness. In my diseasiness, I think if I change how it looks on the outside, it's going to change how it feels on my inside. And all I have to change is the illusion of how it looks. All I have to do is make up enough stories in my head to make it look the way I need it to look. So really all I needed to do was look alcoholic. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me tell you that alcoholic women saved my life, okay? I did not come into Al-Anon surrendered, and I don't think most of us do. I didn't come to Al-Anon looking for recovery. I came into Al-Anon looking for something, one more thing that might work, something else I hadn't thought of. I came in here looking for power. Um, what happens, though, is that life continues to offer, oppor offer opportunities to surrender. And if you, haven't, if you don't know whether or not you've surrendered, chances are real good you haven't. But just keep coming back, because life will offer you another opportunity. <laughs> And if you miss that one, that's okay. There's another one coming right behind that one. It's going to be a little louder, a little more painful. But it's coming. That's just what life does, you know. And my chance at surrender came about three years into the program. And it was the alcoholic women who said to me, honey, those Al-Anons mean well, but they really don't know. They said what you need, this was the third edition, they said you need 448 through 452, the pages out of the big book on acceptance. And they said that's what you need, and you need them every day, and you need them every day till you don't need them every day. And I read them every day, and it changed my life. Alcoholic women saved my life. I didn't have to explain the black hole to them because they'd been there and they knew. So having told you that, <laughs> I came into Al-Anon in gorgeous North Dallas, and so the view I had of alcoholic women was a little skewed. Probably if I'd come in, in California, I'd have had a whole other view. But in gorgeous North Dallas, what it meant was if I wanted to look alcoholic, I had to get a, a, a different wardrobe. So that afternoon, I found and started to wear skin-tight jeans and stiletto heels. I made a couple of discoveries in that little experiment. Uh, number one, I didn't like anything that controlled me like those pants did. And... Um, <laughs> And number two, Al-Anons really are doomed to sensible shoes. Um, we really are built for speed and not for looks. You know, if you love an alcoholic, you have got to be ready to go in a heartbeat. Or you could kill yourself and lose him all at the same time. And the place I decided to do this little experiment, because God loves me, was at the Crested Butte Mountain Conference with 600 of my closest friends. And there were that week, and I think this must have been about 1984, maybe. There, must, there were that week at Crested Butte four people who had between them 125 years of Al-Anon, which was a lot of Al-Anon 20 years ago. Elsa Chamberlain was there, and my sponsor to be Marcy White was there, and Barbara Davis was there, and another lady from Dallas who, uh, that I went to meetings with on a regular basis. I not only got to hear them tell their stories, I not only got to go to meetings with them day after day, I, I got to go to meals with them, but most importantly, I got to watch their interaction with their families. And I finally knew what it was I wanted to be when I grew up. What I want to be when I grow up is I want to be free. I want that freedom that's offered me in step three, the freedom to be who it is God would have me be, free from the bondage of myself, self-pity, fear, self-centeredness. That's what I wanted to be, and that's what I saw in them, and I was so grateful there was such a thing as Al-Anon to be. Um, when I came to Al-Anon, I didn't have very many opinions. I either had the opposite of yours or yours, depending on what I wanted out of you. <laughs> Today I have very strong opinions. That isn't good or bad, it's just different. And that's pretty much all I'm promised in Al-Anon, because we're, we're very careful about making promises. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but Al-Anon's very careful about making promises. <laughs> and, the, and so pretty much the Al-Anon safety net is, <clears throat> well, well, it'll be different. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you reach a point where different is pretty good. You just go for different. Um, uh, it, it, today I have strong opinions. One of the things I have very strong opinions about are people being called Al-Anon. If you want to watch the hair on my neck stand up, let me be in the room when some new drunk comes in and then one of the alcoholics say, oh, look, there's John, the new drunk, and Mary, his little Al-Anon wife, twitching in behind him. And the only reason they're calling her Al-Anon is because she's twitching in behind John. She is not an Al-Anon. She's an alligator. <laughs> Al-Anon is not a program for people who need it. We are not. The statistics are, and if you're an explainer, statistics are ever so important. 
is the statistics are for every alcoholic, there are one to four people profoundly affected. There are 10 to 42 people directly affected. This meeting ought to be 10 to 42 times bigger than the meeting that's going to happen later on. Not a happening thing. It is not a happening thing. You know, I don't, I've never had to try to get into AA, so I, I really can't make this comparison. Oh, yes, I can. Um, <laughs> watch me. <laughs> However hard it is to come to AA, I think it's harder to come to Al-Anon. It is darn near impossible to come in and ask for help when there's nothing the matter with you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I had to come for a while before I figured out where the matter was, you know. <laughs> It was so obvious, you know. Everybody could see it. Um, and as hard as it is to get here, it's harder to stay. The place we lose people is step three. The, the AA 12 and 12 says that step six is what separates the men from the boys, but step three is where we lose folks here. We're ten, we tend to be we're accused of doing the Allen on Waltz, and we, now I think that's what a lot of us do. We do 1, 2, 12, 1, 2, 12, 1, 2, 12. I know what the problem is. I got the answer. Let me tell you about it. And all that other stuff, just filler. You know, that's just filler. Um, because what happens is we get to step three and we tell everybody, we tell folks, okay, it's time for you to make your, to do your third step. And if you do step three, your life is going to change. Oh, and that's when we go, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. There's been a little miscommunication. <laughs> Did you think I wanted my life to change? Oh, no, no, no. No, no. It's not that bad. That's the al chorus, you know. It's not that bad. I just want his life to change, and then I'll be fine, you know. We're like people in a lake of liquid manure up to about here. Oh, it's not very pleasant, but it's ours. And uh, we've been there while it's been building, you know. So you get adjust, and you readjust, you know, and eventually you maladjust. And it, as it gets deeper, you just stand up on your tiptoes a little taller, a little taller, a little taller. And um, people come by in a boat, and they say, you know what? You don't have to live like that, and we can show you the way out of there. And we go, oh, no, 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 that's okay. <laughs> I just want you to keep that guy over there from making waves. <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't like that. Because it, it's very clear from that story that the only thing he can kick up is my stuff. You know, I, I really don't like that. Um, I, these people I sponsor, they say, when is it ever going to be something about them? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> I remember telling my sponsor early on one day, I said, he's pushing all my buttons. She said, what are you doing with buttons? <laughs> That's what inventories are for. It's the button collection time. <laughs> Al-Anon is a hard place. You know, people come into Al-Anon, and uh, sometimes the laughter pulls them in, and sometimes the laughter repels them. Um, alcoholism isn't funny. It's a deadly disease. It kills the people who have it, and it kills the people who love them. Um, and it's not funny. And if you're the person in the family who's shouldering, or it at least feels like you're shouldering all the responsibility, it's serious business. And by God, everybody better see how serious it is. This is not funny. So sometimes the laughter will repel people. Let me tell you that if you hear people laughing about stuff tonight that you don't think is funny, keep coming back. If it's, you can't laugh about something that hasn't healed. But if it's healed for one of us, it can heal for all of us. Now that is a promise. I will make you that promise. Keep coming back. Um, we get people who come to, to our group and they want to come in and they, oh my gosh, they feel so much better. They come to a meeting or two and they really aren't looking for recovery. They're looking for relief, you know. And uh, sometimes, you know, I, I go to a fabulous group and uh, we t we keep we keep the we talk about experience strength and hope we stay in the solution we don't cross talk we start on time we end on time we we're brief in our discussions so that everybody gets a chance to share i mean we just well not always <laughs> most of the time every once in a while somebody will want to tell an old war story about what happened the last time old henry got drunk you know 
and um, she'll say something like, oh, God, you remember that last time old Henry got drunk and he passed out and I poured fingernail polish in one of his open orifices someplace and he got up the next morning and he looked down and he went, oh, my God, and he's been sober ever since. And you tell that in a meeting and you watch the newcomers. They go, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Got what they came for, you know, one more thing. And uh, you got to pray for the Henry they live with. Now, if that sounds like a good solution to you, please let me assure you it is not. <laughs> it is not. These guys and gals that get dry, that are, who are alcoholics, sometimes they trip over a crack in the sidewalk and have a spiritual awakening and they're sober from then on. And a lot of them die and never get sober. We're the last people in the world to cause a spiritual awakening in an alcoholic. I don't know if you've noticed the one difference in our steps. If there are any alcoholics in this room, we have exactly the same steps as AA except the 12th step. And in the 12th step, we have one word that's different. And our 12th step says that we are only to carry messages to others. <laughs> We're not allowed to carry messages to alcoholics anymore. <laughs> how we got here was carrying messages to alcoholics. <laughs> but when you think about it, ours is a much bigger job, you know. So, Al-Anon's not a program for people who need it. It's not a program for people who want it. It's really only a program for people who are willing to work at it because it requires effort. Ongoing, not even consistent, just ongoing effort. Uh, I'm an Al-Anon. The first meeting I came into was a a big book study. The Al-Anons were reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they weren't reading it to find out about him. They were reading it to find out about themselves. I had to read it about 42 times before I quit highlighting parts for my mother and turning back corners for him. <laughs> and on about the 43rd time through there, I realized I have alcoholism. Drinking is but a symptom. I have alcoholism. And when all the alcoholics left me, my life got worse. It didn't get better. They were never the problem. It was always between my ears. Um, when I came to Allen Lund, they told me I had to quit diagnosing people as alcoholic. I'm very good at it. If I love you, it's a sure sign. <laughs> but they said I had to quit diagnosing people that it's a self-diagnosed disease. But they said, babe, if they walk like a duck and they swim like a duck and they quack like a duck, you need to treat them like ducks. You've let other people your whole life dictate reality to you, and it's time you start living in your own world. Um, I... I believe when I was born, I heard quacking. And um, quacking is to me like mother's milk. Apparently, it soothes me. And I, I'm not happy unless I'm listening to quacking. Um, I, I heard my parents quack. I wasn't the only one, but you're, it only matters to you that I heard it. Our tradition says the only requirement for membership is that there be a problem of alcoholism in a relative or friend. It doesn't say the relative or friend has to say they're alcoholic. It just says alcoholism, and it doesn't say you have to see them drinking. I think that's a, that's a huge disservice we do uh, to ourselves. We say, I don't think I belong here because I don't have anybody drinking in my family. You know what? Alcohol, drinking is but a symptom. We are here because of the ism. That's what we're here because of. The way you know whether or not alcoholic works, Al-Anon works for you is if you come. If you come and it works for you, trust me, there's an alcoholic somewhere in your family and you don't even need to know where it is. You don't need to know. doesn't matter. All you need to know is Al-Anon works for you. Um, uh, I, I, sound of quacking. I, I have a number of brothers and sisters who quack. Uh, my grandparents quacked. Um, I, I've married to a number of guys who quacked. Um, I, I raised a quacker. <laughs> And I worked for a guy who quacked in his office for 13 years, but none of those are what made me Al-Anon. You know, what, what I, I came to Al-Anon because of the first part of the first step, because I'm powerless over alcohol. I've stayed in Al-Anon because of the second part of the first step, because my life is unmanageable. My head is unmanageable. My fears are unmanageable. My thinking is unmanageable. I'm not an Al-Anon because of those people. I'm an Al-Anon because I have a 12-step recovery program that I practice like my life depends on it, because I'm convinced today of the fatal nature of my disease. I'm an Al-Anon because I have a committed meeting that I go to every week like a doctor's appointment. If you want to find me, you come Monday night at 6.15 to the Addison Al-Anon family group meeting, and that's where I'll be. And when I walk in that room, they go, oh, Ellen, there you are. Now, sometimes they just say that with their eyes. <laughs> I'm, I hear him say that. <laughs> um, it's a place I belong. Uh, 
I'm an Al-Anon because I have a sponsor who knows everything there is to know about me and more. I've never told her anything that shocked her. I've never told her anything that made her clutch her chest and go, oh, you did what? <laughs> like my poor sainted mother used to do. Um, I'm an Al-Anon, and I'm so grateful that there is such a thing as Al-Anon to be. When I was 17, Mama diagnosed me. Mama diagnosed me as boy crazy. And Mama sent me someplace to be safe. She sent me to Lubbock, Texas. Lubbock, Texas is where the very first Al-Anon meeting in the entire state of Texas was held, was in Lubbock, Texas, because Lubbock, Texas is in a dry area. And this is where they tell alcoholics they can't drink, which is, we all know, makes them drink even faster if you tell them they can't. For a girl like me, uh, it was perfect because it makes them have to be kind of con in concentrated areas, you know. They're not spread out. They're right on the outside of town in those little honky-tonks and the beer joints. And I, it, nobody told me to hunt them there, but that's where I, you know, I'd find myself cruising, just looking. It's like window shopping. I'm just looking, you know. Took me six months to find him, but of course I was always looking for him. I found him. He was married to somebody else and had two kids and was 60 pounds overweight. But I, I didn't, none of that seemed insurmountable to me. I've never liked those easy ones. You know, I don't like those ones who go, oh, you're so cute. Could I have a, no, get away from me. I want those ones you have to fight for, you know. Those ones you have to earn. Those ones you have to make love you. And I can do it, too. I bet you can, too. And you get them and you go, <laughs> for about a week and a half, you know. And then it's like, huh. <laughs> Well, a year later, we shed the wife, the two kids, and the 60 pounds, and I had my prize. Oh, lucky, lucky me. Uh, we were married six months when he hit me the first time. He was drunk when he hit me. He was drunk every time he hit me. I didn't grow up in a family where adults hit each other. So the reaction I had to that was not anything anybody taught me. I came up with that all by myself. I, where I come up with all my fabulous solutions, right here in my little head. I've come to discover in Al-Anon that the problems in my life are really not the problems in my life. The problems in my life are the solutions I come up with for what I perceive to be the problems in my life. The very best thing I could think of to do, it was a moment of clarity. I remember standing there thinking, I've got to find a way to let him know this is not okay. And the very best solution I could come up with was to double dog dare him to do it again. <laughs> didn't take any more insanity on his part to hit me the second time than it did the first time. I didn't realize until I'd been in Al-Anon a while that that was insane. That was insane. For some length of time, I continued to volunteer for that abuse because I double dog dare him to do it again. At some point, I crossed a line and I went from the volunteer to the victim. I don't know when it happened. I know today how it happened. After doing inventory after inventory, I know how it happened. Every time he hit me and I believed what he said, which was if I hadn't done what I did, he wouldn't have to do what he did. Every time he hit me and I believed what he said, which was I deserved that. Every time he hit me and I got up the next morning and I looked in the mirror at a black eye or a bloody nose or a split lip and I said to myself, it's not that bad. I'll just stay in the house another day and another day and another day, and nobody will notice. Every time I did that, a piece of me left and another piece and another piece and another piece until nine years later there was nobody left who could stand up and say, you can't treat me like that. I'm a sticker. I will make my bed and damn near die in it. I stayed nine and a half years in that marriage. The reason I left was because somebody came along who said, you don't have to live like that, and I love you. Oh, <laughs> the magic words were added. When I came to Al-Anon, there was a sign on my desk at work that said, Wonder Woman works here. I always say to people, if you have a business that's failing, it's because you have no alligators working for you. We are fabulous in the workplace. The sicker we are, the better we are in the workplace. We will come in early and stay late. We will eat our lunch while we work. We won't even eat lunch. We'll work right through it. We'll take it home and do it on the weekend. We'll do our job and somebody else's, whether they want us to or not. <laughs> we'll do three other people's jobs, and by God, we'll do them well. 
<laughs> and I looked like the most competent person on the planet. Truth of the matter, that was not the truth. Came to Al Anon, and I had one feeling. I, 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 I really think we tend to come to Al Anon with one of two feelings. We either come in hurt or we come in angry. If we come in hurt, we got to learn to deal with the anger. If we come in angry, we got to learn to deal with the hurt. It's the same energy. It's just whether we're blowing it out or sucking it in, one or the other. And I came in hurt. It was the only feeling I had. My sponsor would say, well, how do you feel about that? And I go, I don't know, hurt, I guess. She made me get one of those magnetic things with the faces on it, you know. And if your face looks like this, this is how you feel. <laughs> and so I'd tell you, she'd say, how do you feel? I don't know. She'd say, go to the refrigerator. Go to the refrigerator and find a face. <laughs> and I'd go back, well, I, uh, it could be confused. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, one day I came up with a second feeling all by myself. I was so pleased. And I knew she would be. And I called her up to tell her, I have another feeling. Great. What is it? I said, Fear. <laughs> Oh, great, she said. That's great. She said, what are you afraid of? I said, oh, do I need to know what I'm afraid of? <laughs> do, do you ever do that? You know you're afraid, but you're not sure what you're afraid about. I can do that with angry, too. I'm angry. Oh, I'm not sure what I'm angry about, though. I'm angry. And I'd say, well, I, I don't know what I'm afraid of. She said, well, it really is helpful if you know. Uh, my sponsor believed in chasing a, um, a, your fear to its root cause. So when I told her I was afraid, she said, we need to know what you're afraid of. And you know what? It was scary for me to look at fear. Fear is not a character defect, but fear of fear, which is what I have, is a character defect. Fear terrified me. I don't want to be afraid. It feels like fear takes over me and I lose, my, I lose myself in that feeling. I don't want to be afraid. So she would say, I'll stay on the phone till we work this out. She didn't make me look at those things alone. And she said, okay, so you're afraid. So what are you afraid of? Well, I don't know. Well, okay, let's talk about it. Okay, well, so I could finally get down to, oh, I know what it is. I'm afraid he's going to leave me. He said he's going to leave me. She said, oh, when did he say he was leaving? I said, um, he said he'd be gone next Friday. She said, honey, you know how to tell if an alcoholic's leaving you? <laughs> if he's gone. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> she said, well, let's say he leaves you. So then she, she and I said, that's it. I'm afraid he's going to leave me. And she said, oh, that's pretty big. So what if he leaves you? Then, then what are you afraid of? You mean there's more? Oh. <laughs> well, let's see if he leaves me. And what I finally got to, if he leaves me, I'm all alone. That's it. I don't want to be all alone. I'm afraid of being alone. She said, oh, now you're alone. What are you afraid of now that you're alone? <gasps> I don't know. Finally got to what I'm afraid of is if I'm al alone is that I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not wise enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time to take care of myself. I'm afraid I won't take care of myself. That sounds pretty silly, but that's exactly the feeling that goes with that is I'm not enough. And if I'm not enough to take care of myself, then I'll die. And what I realize today is there's another fear underneath that, is that I'll die and there is no God. That was my fear. And it became life and death that he not leave. It became life and death that he stay. Um, so when somebody said, I love you to me, what I heard was, I won't leave you. I will take care of you. So when this guy said, I love you, I was, I was like stuck, stuck, stuck to this bad thing over here. I went, oh, I don't need you anymore. <laughs> Okay, another one. And, um, t you know, it took a year to nail him, but I'm like the Mounties. I always get my man. And uh, a year later, I married number two, and uh, you would have loved him. He was, I mean, he was perfect. I knew what I'd done wrong that first time. I knew. And I had sort of had this list, you know, in my head, and I knew what I'd done wrong. This one was the right age, right family, right job, right income, right education, right coloring, everything. He was absolutely perfect. Um, except for this one tiny little flaw. He didn't come home nights. <laughs> but, you know, I'm thinking a couple of home-cooked meals and a little, you know, and I got him. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you mark your territory, but that's how I used to mark mine. <laughs> Back before menopause, you know, when I cared. Anyway. Uh. <laughs> anyway. Um, for some length of time, he came home every night, and I thought I was doing everything right because he came home every night. So I was pretty sure I was doing it right. 
And then the night came, he didn't come home. Well, I recognize now that he was a bar drinker. I realize now that that's a whole subset of alcoholic, you know, this bar drinker, that he was not only addicted to the drink, he was addicted to the place even and the people in the place. I didn't know that. And so when he didn't come home, I lay on the floor of the bathroom and I cried because I was pretty sure he'd seen the two pounds I gained and that's why he didn't love me anymore and that's why I wasn't coming home. And then I decided, oh, stupid, stupid me. This morning when he said what's for dinner, I said roast beef. How stupid can you be? Everybody knows pork chops are his favorite thing. I should have said pork chops. From now on, every time he asks me what's for dinner, I'm always going to say pork chops. (laughs) And then he'll come home. And then I decided what I really need to do was go sit on the sofa and wait. Now, if you are in training for Al-Anon, you must pass graduate waiting. (laughs) And the way that you know you're in graduate waiting is if when you are waiting, you can do nothing else. You can't talk on a phone. You can't read a book. You can't watch TV. The kids would come up and they'd go, Mom. And I'd go, I can't talk to you. I'm waiting. (laughs) And that's because while I was waiting, I was listening. And I was listening for the sound of those tires. There are 48 bazillion other tires on the planet. I don't care about them. (laughs) I know those tires. I have a physical reaction to the sound of those tires that sounds to me a lot like what alcoholics say a drink did for them. I would hear those tires and I would go, ah, he's home, he's home, it's going to be okay. I'm killing him when he walks in the door, but at least he will die in his own bed, you know. <laughs> and head, I'm making up the story about what's happening. You know, I'm making up the story because you got to have a story to go with this stuff. You know, you got to have something to go, you know, a place to go with this thing. And I'm making up the story. And I've decided that I don't know why, but he's driving his car out in the country someplace. I don't know why. And all of a sudden, for some reason, I don't know why, the car blows up and it blows his body into this ditch by the side of the road. And he's bleeding and he's dying. And people can't see him because they're going by up here and he's down in the ditch. And he's not quite dead. And with his dying breath, he's calling me. (laughs) And he's saying, Ellen, (laughs) Ellen, I love you. (laughs) And now wild animals are coming and tearing off body parts and destroying them in the forest. And it'll be seven years before we can identify the body. (sighs) I called that love. I've come to understand that that actually is obsession. (laughs) And the way you know it's obsession is if in your mind somebody dies. You know, in obsession, we take it till somebody dies. Obsession is all-out warfare on powerlessness. The more powerless I feel, the more obsessed I'm going to get. I may get obsessed about the thing I'm powerless over, and I might pick something else out altogether. I'm an equal opportunity obsessor. I can obsess about my food or yours. I can obsess about my children or yours. I can obsess about the politics. Oh, don't get me started. I can obsess about just about anything. Exercise. Shopping. I can, I can obsess about just about anything. And uh, it's a sign. I know today when that obsessive thought thing starts in my head, there's a place in my life I'm powerless, and I haven't either been willing or able to look at what it is. Um, well, he came home. Of course he did. I've discovered that 99 times out of 100, they come home. It might be that day or the next day or three years later, but they come home, you know. And I met him at the door like a three-year-old who's been crying all afternoon, and you said, stop it. I was at that (laughs) place, you know, with the big red eyes and the snot slinging everywhere. I think about that, and I think, no wonder he drank, you know. (laughs) Jesus, if that's waiting for me at home, I'll just have another, okay. And uh, and I asked him the second stupidest question we ever asked. The stupidest, of course, is, have you been drinking? The second stupidest is where have you <laughs> because truly the only answer that was going to suit me was in a ditch bleeding anything else was going to hurt my feelings really and he said yeah he knew where i was well you know that's the truth i didn't know where he was he only went three places he was at home at work or in the trap room drinking but i have the ability to hold opposing thoughts and they never touch and the two thoughts in my head were number one he loves me more than anything in the world because that's what he said And number two, he's in the trap room drinking. But if this one's true, this one can't be. And my life hung on this one, that he loved me more than anything in the world. And in my diseasiness, I'd rather wish him dead than know the truth. And that's what I did. And he said, Jesus, you have certainly worked yourself up into a state, little missy. (laughs) He said, I think you're about
about as crazy as your mother. <laughs> and he said, I, I don't know why I stay married to you. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. Now, what's the matter with this picture? He's three hours late and drunk, and I'm standing at the door apologizing. I have an addiction to mind-altering men. Actually, I've discovered it's not limited to men. <laughs> Anybody can just alter my mind. They don't even have to want to. I just seem to loan it out, you know. Um, so we rocked on like that. And that, there was a, I worked at a school, and this lady called me at this school one day, and she, she was an angry lady, and I was always afraid of angry people. I would, I, I would have told you it's because they reminded me of alcoholics. You weren't sure what an, al- what an angry person was going to do next. And I always need to know what you're going to do next. I like to know what's going to happen next. And I say it so I can be prepared. That is just another euphemism for control. I just want to be in control is really what I mean. Um, she was, and then the day she called me, she was crying. If you want to watch the alarms go off for an alligator, put her in the room with somebody crying. The primary alligator illusion is when you're okay, then I'll be okay. And I have to do everything in my power to make you okay. I will go places I don't want to go with people I don't want to be with. I'll stay up late when I'm tired. I won't eat when I'm hungry. I'll sit up all night with your mother in the in the hospital when I don't like hospitals and I sure don't like your mother. But I'll do it. And I don't do it because it's a loving, kind thing to do. I do it because I need a reaction back from you. I need a certain reaction back from you to tell me I'm enough, to tell me I'm okay. And if I don't get that reaction from you, I'll try harder. I'll do it on Tuesdays. I'll serve pork chops. I used to take off my clothes. I don't do that anymore. Pretty, I'm afraid today it would have the opposite reaction. <laughs> All illusion. Um, we have a deal in my in my home group, by the way. We must have seven boxes of Kleenexes that sit on the on our tables. I don't know about your meetings, but somebody cries in just about every Al-Anon meeting I go to. It just happens, either because it's a safe place or just because it hurts. They cry. And we have a deal in my Al-Anon group. When somebody starts crying, we do not shove the Kleenex at them. It's a very subtle way of saying your tears must be bothering you because they're bothering me. Dry them up. It may be that the best thing we do for each other in Al-Anon is we attend each other's pain. We don't tell each other, wipe that look off your face and you can come back to another meeting. When you get a better attitude, you can come out of the bathroom. We say, stay with us. Whatever you've been through, one, at least one of us has been through it too. When somebody starts to cry in a meeting or tell us their sad tale of woe, we don't put our arms around them and tell them everything's going to be okay because we can't make that guarantee. You know, what I'm told to do when I get up here behind the podium is I'm supposed to tell you what I used to be like and what happened and what I'm like today, not what it's like today. Because there are plenty of times today when it still sucks. The only thing that's different today is my response to what it's doing. So anyway, this lady called and she was crying. And she said, my husband is in a 12-step recovery program for alcoholism. And as part of his recovery, we're going to pay the school back all the money we owe you. But it's going to take us a while, I just wanted to tell you. And she's crying. And all my alarms are going off. And I said, oh, I understand. I understand. My husband drinks too much, too. Now, his drinking was not the problem. He wasn't coming home nights. That was the problem. I understood the drinking was not about me, but the not coming home nights, I thought, was about me. If I was a better wife, if the kids were quieter, if they were smarter, if the house was cleaner, if I, did, if I moved the TV three inches over here or something, if I could do something, he would come home. And I wasn't going to tell her that because I thought it was about me. So I just threw out this other thing. My husband drinks too much, which was not the problem. I didn't know I was talking to somebody who was new in the program and we're deadly when we're new. We have a lot of answers. We don't know what the questions are, but we have a lot of answers. And we're so happy to share them. Um, She hunted me for about six months. She didn't call me every day, but she would call me every, every few days, every few weeks. And inevitably, it was the morning after one of those nights. I don't know how she knew. And I ended up in a, in a psychologist's office, a psychologist who worked through our school who knew me and knew my family, and he was the one who said to me, I don't have your answers, and the people who might have them are the al And the next time she called, I said, oh, okay. I was like coming out of the jungle with my arms up, surrendering to the enemy. I said, okay, I'll go. And she escorted me to my first six meetings because she had the sense that I would not take myself, and she took me. I landed in a nest of winners. 
and they say you should stick with the winners. Most of the time they don't have name tags on, but they do this weekend. As far as I'm concerned, the winners are the people who want more than the first miracle. They're the people who want more than just to survive. They're the people who want a new life. They want to be the best them they can be. You know, the best thing I ever did in Al-Anon when I was new was go to open AA meetings. I found out about the disease of alcoholism, reading the big book and going to, going to open AA meetings. When my alcoholics talked, all I could hear was my own pain. When I heard somebody I wasn't emotionally attached to talk, I started to see where the disease was and the man ended. And I could start to find some compassion. Um, I landed in a nest of people. I really thought the first step was get in the car. <laughs> because they would say, so-and-so is doing the steps across town. We're going tonight. Get, we'll come by. Get in the car. It wasn't, do you want to go? It was, get in the car. And I got in the car. You know, They went to conferences, and I got in the car. I just went where they were going. You know, My husband actually was thrilled to have me go. Um, one of the, things they, the first things they'd said to me was, shut up. <laughs> just shut up, Ellen. You have nothing to share with him. Just shut up. He was thrilled. Um, one, one Monday morning, I got a call from a lady. He said, I need to talk to you. Your husband has been out here with my husband all weekend long drinking. And I said to him, how can you do this? How can you treat your wife like this? How can she put up with this behavior? And he said, you'd found a way and I should call you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it was 12 stepping for Al and on. <laughs> she was too angry. She was way too angry to be able to stay. She had to go back out again. But anyway... We rocked on like that, and, um, and he continued to drink. And we, he went to treatment centers, and, and he would interview them, and he would say, how do you know you're an alcoholic? He was looking for an age or a day or a quart or a ring mark or something. And at the last place we went to, the guy said, you know what? I can't tell that you're alcoholic looking at you, but I can tell looking at her. And I started to cry. It was the first time someone in the earth world had acknowledged how hard it is to live in alcoholism. Um, you know who uses the insurance first in an alcoholic home? Non-alcoholics. We have an assortment of stress-related diseases. Um, not quite three years into the program, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was 38 years old. There was no history of it in my family. Um, there were all sorts of... Uh, there were studies back then that said that cancer was a stress-related disease. Um, I've hung my life on a couple of lines out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and one of them is um, the the last column, nothing but nothing happens by God by accident in God's world. I love that. I love those always and never things. And then there's the last column of the four-step inventory that basically says, and what was your part? It was the first time I recognized that I have a part in everything that happens in my life. I am not victim in some place and volunteer in others. I have a part in all of it. It's an empowering thing to know because all I'm responsible for is my part. I can make a difference in my own life. I wanted to know what my part was in the cancer. I got in a step study, and um, at the, uh, they gave me a 60-40 chance of living another five years. Um, what I discovered was that the cancer I have, and I was blessed with doctors who didn't feel like they needed to give me a reason why I had cancer. They, they were willing to let me diagnose myself. And what I discovered was the cancer I had was a stress-related disease, that living in active alcoholism, I will break out in malignancies. Cancer is pretty prevalent in alcoholic homes. Can, counter, I don't know if you can count around in a meeting. We had a meeting the other night of probably about 30 people at my Al-Anon group, and six of us, five of us have had breast cancer and one of us has had colon cancer. That's a lot of people in, out of 30 to have had cancer. It's a, for me, it was a stress-caused disease. Um, he left. I told him that. I, I, I'd said it a thousand times, and for the first time I meant it. I said, if you can't stop drinking, you can't stay here, because I realized my life was on the line. I'm a sticker. I'll stay there until I damn near die. And I said, if you can't stop drinking, you can't stay. And this time I meant it, and he had to leave. He left between chemo and radiation. And if you asked him why he left, he would have told you it was that crazy daughter of mine that anyone who had to live with that went should drink to. I didn't have to drink. I just didn't go in her room. I had a deal with her. She could keep her room however she wanted to until she started to lower my property value. Then I was coming in. <laughs> and I was waiting for a smell or something. When she was about seven, as a matter of fact, I remember sending her upstairs to clean her closet, and she came down one day and she said, Mama, can I stop now? The smell is hurting my eyes. <laughs> Anyway, uh, 
a couple of years later, they called from her school. They said, there's something the matter with your daughter. I said, duh. They said, uh, well, we want to send her for an evaluation. <laughs> and two days later, the guy at the treatment center said, Ms. Davis, hate to tell you this, but we do believe your daughter's alcoholic. And I said, yes. And he said, huh. Um, <laughs> we've not had a lot of mothers react like that. And I'm like, yes, she's alcoholic, all right. I thought she was crazy. It's an Al-Anon disease. No sign she'll ever get any help for that. But alcoholic, yes. She's 17 and I can make her do stuff, you know. <laughs> so I took her to a place that would force feed the steps into her. It was the only thing I knew that worked. Um, I'm so grateful that alcoholics do what they do for themselves and not for any kind of success rate. You know, statistics are that um, these young people who come in, 80% of them have to go back out because they're not done. And my daughter was one of those. She stayed sober about a year and a half, and she went back out. And uh, there were there were long periods of time, months, when I didn't know where she was. You know, I didn't know what state she was in. I didn't know what was happening to her, but I knew it wasn't good, whatever it was. Um, at some point, she called me and said, Mom, I have to have $300 by tomorrow morning or else. And I had to tell her I didn't have $300 to give her. I did not bail her out of jail. She did not call me. She did time in all the little jails in our area and um, if, uh, and probably others. I don't know. But I do know she did time in our little jails. Her friends called me. And they said, we're going to bail her out one more time. And it's the last time we're going to bail her out. I said, thank you for telling me. There's <laughs> nothing I can do. Um, my daughter... Uh, reached a point where uh, on June 29th of 1990 she walked back into Alcoholics Anonymous and I had nothing to do with it. AA had everything to do with it because they hadn't treated her like she was too young. They hadn't treated her like she hadn't suffered long enough. They hadn't treated her like because she did drugs that somehow negated her alcoholism. My daughter got sober twice before it was ever legal for her to drink once. She has 16 years of continuous sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is, that's AA's miracle. That is not mine. The best thing I ever did for that kid was get a program, get a life, and get out of her way and let her do what she needed to do. Um, In that year and a half, she was sober. She started hanging out in slippery places with slippery people. And I said, for the umpty ump time, meant it for the first time, hear the rules of my house. If you cannot... If you cannot abide by them, you cannot stay here because I recognized I had had reconstructive surgery the summer before and I recognized that the only way I was going to heal was in in peaceful surroundings and she wasn't going to give me peace. It was up to me to make my peaceful surroundings and I wanted to heal. I wanted to heal and I said, if you can't, if you can't abide by the rules, you're going to have to move. And I planned the day to kick her out to be the day I was leaving to go to Crested Butte to be with 600 of my closest friends because I didn't want to kick my daughter out. I love my daughter. I adore my daughter. I wanted her healthy, happy, home, and whole, and she couldn't do any of those things. And that was the morning she threw herself across my bed and said, you're going to be a grandmother. She was 18, and she was pregnant, and I thought that changed everything. I thought I was going to have to stay home and take care of her, and I thought I'd die. That's how it felt. And I finally picked up the phone and I called my sponsor and I told her what happened. And she said, do you want her to stay? And I said, no, I don't want her to stay. And I feel terrible about that because I don't want her to stay. She said, honey, there are only so many bad feelings in every relationship. Those are hers. Let her have them. She said, if you don't want to stay, if you don't want her to stay, I'll stay on the phone while you tell her. I can see that phone lying on my bed. And I quit hurting. I thought the pain was about kicking her out, but the pain was about holding on when it was time for her to go. And I quit hurting. And I went up to Crested Butte to be with kind of my closest friends, and she broke in through the windows. <laughs> well, we all knew that was going to happen. But anyway, we went through a, a difficult fall. She went around telling everybody how mean I was, that she was pregnant, and I wouldn't let her come, come home. And I went around telling people what she was doing to me now. I was at uh, the Brass Riverside Conference, where I'll be next weekend, and uh, my friend Betty Ross was taping, and I said, Buddy, she's pregnant at me now. And I was serious as a stroke, serious as a stroke. And Buddy took me serious, too, you know, and Buddy said, oh, honey, I understand. He said, but you know what? He said, our son's girlfriend had a baby out of wedlock, and that child has been the light of our lives. It never occurred to me I might like it. Old ideas. I am full of shoulds. Shoulds are somebody else's rules. And as long as I got a should, 
who's going to punish me if I don't do the should? That's the question I have to ask myself. Who, who's going to punish you if you don't do the should? al allowed me to change my mind. The fact of the matter is I've loved babies my whole life, and until lately I, I hadn't had my fill. Um, and, and God was offering me a baby, and I was doing the yeah, but thing. You know, yeah, but. I think sometimes that the, the sanity offered us in step two may be nothing short of paradise, but the reason we don't get paradise is because we do yeah, but. Yeah, but not this way, God. Not today, God. Not this child. It's not right, God. I'm telling God how we ought to be running the universe. It's not right. My journey in Al-Anon has been the journey from yeah, but to thank you. When I get to the place where I can say thank you, thank you for everything exactly as it is, that's acceptance to me. Acceptance is not putting up with. That's just tolerance. Acceptance is thank you for everything exactly the way it is. And I decided to say thank you for this baby. A couple of months later, my daughter called. She said, Mom, that blue blanket you're knitting, knit faster. Had a sonogram today. It's twin boys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, those alcoholics. If one's good, let's have another. <laughs> 18 years old, having twins. Had every intention of bringing them home. Um, it's a long story. As you can see, I don't know any short stories. Um <laughs> Um, I told her I'd have more peace of mind knowing where she was and where, where she wasn't. So I brought her and the babies home from the hospital. The little twin weighed 4.0 pounds. The bigger twin weighed 5.1 pounds the day we brought them home. They were about four weeks early. and uh, We brought them home. When they were three weeks old, the little twin went into heart failure, and she called me at work and didn't know what to do. And she said, I think he's okay, but, 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 but. I went home, got the baby. We raced to the hospital, and baby's okay, but baby has a big hole in his heart, and he has these other things going on, and she's itching to get back out in the world. You know, she, she sure doesn't want to be stuck with these two babies. And she's got this huge should going on, you know. And at five weeks, she said, Mom, I'm, I'm going to give them up, and you can have them if you want them. And uh, it was, uh, that was one of the toughest decisions I've ever made in my life. I did a lot of uh, praying. I did a lot of writing. I did a lot of talking to my sponsor. My sponsor had been telling me for years that God wants for me what I want for me in my heart of hearts. But I'm such an al and I'm so afraid I might pick the wrong thing. What if there's something else better comes next week? And I'm stuck with this thing back here. Ooh, man, I hate that, don't you? So I just don't make any decisions. You know, I just let life decide for me, you know. If you want to watch something painful, watch a group of al try to decide where to go for lunch. <laughs> oh, I don't care. Where do you want to go? Oh, I don't care. Thank God they're double winners, you know, that walk up and go, Mexican food, we're going for Mexican food. Oh, just what I wanted, Mexican food, you know, and off we go. Um, she said, honey, here's the deal. The deal is your job is walking in the direction of your dreams. God's deal is where you get. And God's promise is this or something better. God's not a terrorist waiting around the corner to test your patience. God really wants you happy, joyous, and free. God really wants you to have everything. Walk in the direction of your dreams. And where you get is God's deal. So I went, she gave me power of attorney and moved out, and I went to adoption agencies, and I said, I'm looking for a family that wants two babies and a grandmother. (laughs) And we thought it would take weeks, and it took months. And uh, when they were just about five months old, we found the family that didn't care that there were two babies, didn't care that one of them had some physical issues, didn't care that the the birth family wanted to stay involved. They let me pick the day to surrender the babies, and I picked the day to be the day I was going to Crested Butte to be with 600 of my closest friends because I knew I was going to need intensive care. It was the hardest thing I ever did was to give up those babies. And uh, so on the way to Crested Butte, my son and my daughter and I turned our babies over at Lutheran Services to their new family. Um, They were 18 years old this last March. And uh, it's been quite a trip, quite a trip. There hadn't been a month of their lives until this summer when they turned adult on me all of a sudden. There hadn't been a month in their lives when they hadn't seen me. I have a meal with them every month. They come and spend time with me in the summer. They come at Christmas. They come at Easter. They have a little sister who's 18 months younger than they are. And when she was born, their parents said, guess what? She doesn't have a grandmother. Uh-huh. I not only didn't lose the boys, I got a girl in the bargain. You know, I got a granddaughter in the bargain. And, and um, uh, I, I, you know, th- these last few years have been really hard on their parents. Their parents have no idea about alcoholism. They have no idea. And uh, it is rampant in those boys, the ism is. The, the older twin, 30 seconds older, um, he's, had, he's done time in juvenile detention a couple of times because he keeps forgetting that the rules are for everybody. 
And um, the, the littler twin, he got caught just inside the Walmart doors um, with his latest addition to his ladies' underwear collection that he had taken out of there. And um, um, the parents have aged remarkably in the last 10 years. And I said to them, at, well, in the last five years, and I said to them finally one time I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I said, you know, if I thought they were going to be easy to raise, I'd have kept them. <laughs> <laughs> One of them just got kicked out of a traveling salesman job selling magazines, and I, he, he was telling me what he did and trying to not tell me that he got kicked out. But I suspect if you shoot BBs in a hotel and fill up a hotel room with BBs, pretty soon they're going to ask you to leave. Um, and he got stuck at the, the, the bus station in Dallas, Texas yesterday with a nine-hour layover to get to his home, which is an hour away. Grandma, can you come get me? Yeah, no, my, actually, my husband went and got him and brought him over so I could see him and touch him and feel him and make sure he was okay and then take him home. Goodbye. I love you. See you. Um, about the time the boys left, I decided that uh, I was going to have to quit dating. I had done an inventory, and I discovered since I was 12, I've either been chasing after, catching, going with, waiting for, engaged to, married to, divorced from, engaged to, married to, divorced from, somebody. But there's always been somebody. I walk with this big empty hole beside me, and I throw people in the hole. And I'd like to tell you how special they are, except I don't remember most of their names. <laughs> and um, I decided the only way I was going to figure out who I was was if I was separate, if I was a separate person. So I decided to quit dating. I, and it isn't like I had to go to the front steps and say, sorry, boys, I've sworn off. <laughs> it's, like, it's like God and I decided the same day. Um, if you're not going to hang out with guys, it leaves you one other choice, girls. I've never liked them much myself. Um, it, I don't have anything against girls. It's just that I'm just not a girly girl. I'm just not. You know, I shop like a man. The idea, thank you, love, it, the idea of if you if you don't know what you want, don't go in there, if you know what I say. Um, and when you go, get it and get out, you know. And um, if you have something to say to me on the phone, say it. And then hang up the phone. Um, I hung out with girls for about, I don't know how long. It seems like years. I suspect it was probably months. <laughs> and um, I made an amazing discovery in that. that God, I wanted God to speak to me in thunder and lightning. And the truth of the matter is God speaks to me in the language I understand best. And the, under, the language I understand best is another female. And at the end of that time in the wilderness, um, I made an amazing discovery, and that's that I'm enough for me. Nobody has to be mad, added to make me okay. I'm enough for me. So then this guy asked me out. <laughs> match my list and the Alateens had made me a list and he didn't match the Alateens list and I'd known him forever and he wasn't in the program and, and of course we're married now and um, <laughs> we've been married 14 years and he came uh, he says he dated his way into Alcoholics Anonymous we'd been married two years when he decided one day he was alcoholic and he walked up and he took a chip and he hadn't had a drink since then his uh, birthday was last week 12 years in Alcoholics Anonymous the best thing I ever did was get a program get a life and get out of his way let him do what he needed to do um, real quickly, a couple of years, uh, let's see, nine years ago, ten years ago, my uh, son said, Mom, we want you to quit your job and stay home, and we're going to have a baby, and we want you to take care of our baby. Now, the only people who ever saw me angry before I came down on were my children, and they saw me rageful. I pinned them to the wall with my rage. But now my son wanted me to stay home and take care of their baby. A couple of months later, my daughter who was living in California said, Mom, we're moving home and we're having a baby, and we want you to quit your job and stay home and take care of our baby. And my husband said, No, 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 you can't do that. Um, he said, We need that money you're making. And, you're blah, 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 blah. and finally, you heard a tape of Clint H. And somebody asked Clint H. exactly how much money would you have to have so you wouldn't feel financially insecure. And Clint said, Well, I guess just enough money so I wouldn't have to trust God. Yeah. So when my husband heard that, he said, okay, you can come home. And I came home and opened a little business called Mom's Better Babies, Affordable Daycare for Your Priceless Children. But the only ones that I'll take care of are my grandchildren, so don't ask. And uh, <laughs> the, day, the first day I started and I got Madison, Madison was exactly to the day the same age the twins were the day we gave them up. And five months later... Uh, no, four months later, Tristan was born, and when he was three weeks old, he came to me. Fourteen months later, Kennedy was born, and when she was four weeks old, she came to me. And seven months later, Sutton was born, and Sutton came to me at two months old. Um, and I did daycare for those four kids um, up until summer before last. I still have them all summer. I still have them every break. I had them all last week because they had fall break. I had them all Saturday night. They think they're siblings. They don't know that they're cousins. It's the best job any human ever had. I could go to work in my pajamas. 
I could sleep with my clients. I could get paid to sleep with my clients. It was, it's the best. It is the best. It's the best. And I've gone through this horrible grieving thing when I gave them up. It really was painful. I didn't have that with either one of my kids because I've changed the locks on both of them. But Al-Anon gives you the chance to to experience everything there is in life. I used to think that when I died and went to heaven, God was going to say, pull out the VCR and the tape, and I want to know how her husband and her children turned out. And if they turned out to be fine, upstanding members of the community, she's earned her way into heaven and she can come in. I'm so glad you let me find another God. I'm not sure what's going to happen today when this is done, but i got a story. Of course I do. My sponsor said I can have this story. And my body gets tired of doing whatever in the world it is we're doing here. And that part of me that's always been God's goes to wherever it is God is. When I get there, God's going to go, Oh, Ellen, there you are. You know, why would God greet me with less love than you do? And who else's love do you greet me with but God's love? And when I get there, he's going to say, Oh, precious, you know what? Heaven's heaven when you're not here, but it's just not perfect without you. And he's going to say, You know what? I've been running a little experiment down there. Nothing you can pass or fail, but I know you've been paying close attention. I'd like to know your opinion. (laughs) Hey, it's my story. It's my heaven. God wants my opinion. He's going to say, First off, did you have a good time? You know, there was nothing I did to torture you. There was no reason for flowers to be different colors except I thought it would make you smile. And I knew you'd love babies, so I hope you didn't miss any of them I put in your life. And because of you, I'm going to be able to say, oh, yes, God, I had a great time at your party. Thanks for asking me. And the second thing he's going to say is, were you Ellen? You were the only one like that I made. I had things for you to do that nobody else could do. I had things I needed you to do because my hands are too big. I spent so much of my life trying to be what I thought other people wanted me to be that when I realized that was going to be a question, I got scared because I was afraid maybe I hadn't lived my life. I do a written inventory every night, and for a number of years, one of the questions I asked myself at night, one of the statements I made for myself was, today, Ellen, and I would write down every day what I thought was mine to do that day. This was mine to do today. You could have had another speaker and been done, oh, so long ago, and Tim wouldn't be anxious over there at all. Um, But that's not what happened. What happened was you got me. Um, After a couple of years, I looked back through my journals and I recognized that 99% of what I'd written down is what you would have called service work. That's how I know I'm being me. The last thing he's going to say is, babe, did you ever get the joke? I got the joke the year of cancer. I got the joke standing at the back door of my house with no hair on my body except for gray, gray nerve endings that kind of blew around on the top of my head, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no hair on my body um, with a hot pink neon orange daughter who was living over the edge of the planet somewhere and a beige and navy blue son who was disappearing every day more and more and more into himself and a husband who would say what's for dinner and might not come home for a week. And I looked down at my legs, and I realized as I went out that I was going to have to shave my legs. <laughs> I'd lost all the hair, except under my arms and on my legs. And, and I laughed. I laughed. And I, what I recognized was, you know what? I am just fine. I've, I've lived so much of my life afraid of what I'm not going to get that I think I have to have or afraid I'm going to lose something I think I have to have to be okay that I almost missed the miracle of plenty that is right in front of me, that is now, that is me. Um, Bill Cosby says the glass isn't half full or half empty. The glass, it depends on whether you're drinking or pouring. The miracle is when you allow me to tell my story and pour, when I sit down, I'm the one whose cup overflows, and I thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.